Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. We love God, we ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information from the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious, it's fun, it's your Catholic Drive Time. And welcome to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Today is Monday, January 1st, 2023. The feast. Oh. The first mistake of many, I am sure, of saying 2023. January 1st, 2024. Thank you very much, Mysterious Voice from Heaven. I mean, Tim Mott. Uh, (laughs) The saint of the day we're going to go through is Pope St. Sylvester. Although, so this is from Dom Garanger's liturgical year. Dom Garanger says, Although the place of honor and the service of the king belongs to the martyrs, the confessors also fought manfully for the glory of his name and the spreading of his kingdom. They are crowned with the crown of justice and Jesus who gave it to them. He made it part of his own glory that they should be near his throne. The church would therefore grace this glorious Christmas octave with the name of one of her children who should represent at Bethlehem the whole class of her unmartyred saints. She chose St. Sylvester, a confessor who governed the Church of Rome and therefore the universal church, a pontiff whose reign was long and peaceful, a servant of Jesus Christ adorned with every virtue, who was sent to edify and guide the world immediately after those fearful combats, which had lasted 300 years, during which millions of Christians had gained victory by martyrdom under the leadership of 30 popes, the predecessors of Sylvester, and they too, all martyrs. So it is that Sylvester is a messenger of the peace which Christ came to give to the world, of which the angels sang on Christmas night. He is the friend of Constantine. He confirms the Council of Nicaea, He organizes the discipline of the church for the new era in which she is now entering, the era of peace. His predecessors in the See of Peter imagined Jesus in his suffering. Sylvester represented Jesus in his triumph. Sylvester's feast during this octave reminds us that the divine child who lies wrapped in swaddling clothes and is the object of Herod's persecution is notwithstanding all these humiliations, the prince of peace, the father of the world to come. Oh, praise be to God. That is the commentary from the liturgical year by Dom Prosper Garanger. I know if you ever had a chance to get liturgical year by Dom Prosper Garanger, it's definitely worth getting. So what exactly should we ask for from St. Sylvester on this, his feast day? Well, we should ask our Lord to grant us this period of peace, to usher in the reign of Mary, for right now it feels like the first three centuries, maybe not a martyrdom of blood, but it feels like a very similar tumultuous situation in the church today. And so we ask St. Sylvester to grant us the grace to usher in the reign of Mary, that we stay steadfast in the faith and pray for the coming of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Pope St. Sylvester, pray for us. Joining us right now is Rudy Carlos. Good morning to you, Rudy. Good morning. Uh, Sylvester, I thought you were talking about a cat for a a moment. Sylvester? Sylvester the cat. Uh, You're talking about a pope, though. I'm talking about a pope. Not not a booty cat. (laughs) Not a booty cat, okay? So there you go, folks. Now, it's really cool. Pope St. Sylvester, these early popes, the fact that the first 30 popes were martyred, Mind blowing, yeah. Mind blowing. Yeah, it, our modern sensibilities can't even imagine that. Yeah, yeah. Think about a situation where pretty much every Christian you knew was being martyred, and you know, whenever things like that come up, I always think to myself, "Man, most of us can't even handle like financial martyrdom, mm-hmm. where we're like, man, I might lose my job if I speak out, or oh man, my friends might leave me. I may not have any friends." Which actually brings me back to Professor Plinio, because Professor Plinio talks often about moral courage, about how he said the crusaders of the 21st century, and he's talking about crusaders like people who go out and speak the truth, that they are more heroic than the crusaders of the crusades against the Muslims. He says, why is that the case? 
He said the crusaders of that fought in the early church and in the medieval church, those crusaders had the 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 love of the people. The people cheered them on. They threw parades for them going out and coming in. They had human respect. They were promoted by the popes. They were preached. The crusades were preached by saints. And they had the glory of battle. They had all these different things. He said, but the crusaders of the 21st century, they get mocked. They get derided. They get hated by the clergy, by the hierarchy. They get hated by your peers. And nobody likes the crusaders of the 21st century. And they all tell you, chill out, man. Be cool. Don't be so mean. And that's the message you get. And so it's harder to be a saint or to be a crusader today than it was in the past. Amen. I agree. Yeah, financial martyrdom. Whew. I mean, that's that's just a little drop in the bucket compared to what people have experienced in the past. But you're right. And I think God makes us for the time that we're in. You know, there's a tendency for us to uh, want to desire, oh, I wish I was born in this period. I wish I was born in that period. I wish I could have experienced that. God put you here for this reason. For some reason, God in his providence puts you here so that you can experience this lifetime and uh, be a saint right now. So be a saint today. Amen. Amen. And speaking of being a saint, we're in the new year. <laughs> did you do anything? <laughs> did you make any goals this year? Any what one might call New Year's resolutions? Yeah, I did. Uh I am going to become a saint this year. <laughs> oh, no way. You're going to die? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> in a state of grace. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, hopefully not die, but hopefully if you do in a state of I grace. I am going to die to 2023. Self. Oh, okay. My old self. I'm going to put away the old man. I'm not going to... Uh, what's the what's the quote about leaven? I'm going to throw away the old leaven or... I have Don't no use idea. the old leaven. Something about leaven. I'm going to leaven my life with Jesus, with the sacraments, with all of those tools that God has given us uh, to make me a, a saint. But no, in reality, I mean, pff, that is what I desire. But as far as actual resolutions, you know, things that I can tangibly grasp, no, not really. I stopped making resolutions like in 2017. <laughs> I was like, let's be honest. I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna do this. I know myself. I know my. my I know my faults. My temperament. It just doesn't work for well, me. Well, I'm gonna buy a gym membership and then I'm gonna go every single day for a week and, and then never it. go again. No, I'm not gonna cancel. You're not I'm gonna, gonna continue cancel. paying for for the rest of the Got year. It. Okay. But then I will not go back for the rest of the year. See, but I'll keep telling myself I should keep paying for it because I'm going to go back tomorrow. With gym memberships, though, it's tough. I, I used to go to the gym when my buddy was my neighbor, and I could go with him to the mm -hmm. gym, no problem. But then we both got married, our life changed, he moved away, and I'm like, man, I have nobody to work out with. So I, it's not like a resolution that I can take on these days because now I have kids and it's impossible for me to leave the house. So, you know, I have to uh, be realistic with my my resolutions. I think, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a resolution out here. Okay. I'm going to hold you For to myself, you thank you. I hope that you will. You're a good friend. I'm going to bind the 1800s Bible that needs repair in my garage. Okay. I've had this book for five years now. I purchased it off Craigslist back in California. This is a an old Haydock Bible. So we when we read the uh, the scriptures, you know, sometimes we have Haydock's commentary on the scriptures. This actually has Haydock's commentary in the footnotes of every page. It's an incredible thing. It's huh. uh, illustrated from the 1800s, but it's just been sitting there. And That's a very reasonable goal. Yeah, it is. Here's the thing, though. We know, as our family, we're like, ah, we know we got to meditate on the scriptures, but we don't do it. And we have the perfect opportunity. We have this great Bible with commentary right there. So you can go to your scriptorium and repair, repair that Bible this year. Amen. All right. I'm going to hold you to it, Rudy. And side note, before we jump into the rest of the show today, I did was thinking about what you were saying. I was thinking of, and I was looking over at, at Tim Mott, and I'm sure he was thinking the same thing as I was. And I think of the quote from Tolkien. I wish it need not have happened in my time, mm. said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. So true, King. So true, Gandalf, the fictional character. 
<laughs> All right, coming up in this hour, we have a lot going on. We're going to talk about a PSA on confession. We're going to talk about the miraculous medal and the graces of Our Lady. We're going to talk to Father Thaddeus on the Immaculate Conception. He wrote an excellent book on the consecration of the Immaculate Conception. And we're going to talk about the Habsburgs, lessons from the Habsburg Empire, Eduardo Habsburg is going to be on with us talk about that. So all this coming up in this hour, but let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. We're going to be praying for the salvation of souls, the liberty and exaltation of Holy Mother Church, for our friends, family, and benefactors, and all those that we promise to pray for. O divine infant Jesus, I have recourse to thee. Please, through thy blessed mother, assist me in this necessity, because I firmly believe that thy divinity can help me. I hope with confidence to obtain thy holy grace. I love thee with all my heart and with all the strength of my soul. I repent sincerely of my sins, and I beg thee, O good Jesus, to grant me the strength to triumph over them. I resolve never more to offend thee, and I come to offer myself to thee, with the intention of enduring everything rather than to displease thee. Henceforth I desire to serve thee with fidelity, and for the love of thee, O divine infant, I will love my neighbor as myself." All-powerful infant, O oh, Jesus, I implore thee again, assist me in this need. Grant me the grace of possessing thee eternally with Mary and Joseph, and of adoring thee with the angels in the heavenly court. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now, the gospel of the day. Okay, before we jump into the gospel of the day, I did also want to mention that we normally switch the prayers up when we change months. But I'm going to be honest. I uh, completely forgot that we were going to go into January 1st, 2024, as you could tell from the beginning when I got the year wrong. So tomorrow, probably, hmm, well, we'll see what happens tomorrow. We'll see what happens tomorrow. So stay tuned for foreshadowing. Hmm. We'll find out. Okay. The gospel of the day comes from Luke chapter two, verses 16 through 21. Now, this is when the shepherds make haste to Bethlehem and see the child lying in a manger. So what should we meditate upon here? Cornelius Alapide, meditating on verse 16, says, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. With haste. Now from their longing and zeal to see Christ. Now, I think that verse alone, that one little two words there, with haste, it shows us how we should respond to Christ. Whenever we feel an inclination from Christ to do something. Like, for instance, you feel that tugging on your soul after you've done something wrong to go to confession. Don't dilly-dally. Don't wait for the weekend. Don't wait for the end of the month. Instead, from your longing and zeal to see Christ, make haste. Hence, St. Ambrose remarks, Thou seest that the shepherds make haste, for no one seeks after Christ with slothfulness. And the venerable bead says, the shepherds hasten, for the presence of Christ must not be sought with sluggishness. And many perchance that seek Christ do not merit to find him because they seek him slothfully. How many people do you know are like mm, very lukewarm? They say, oh, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, thinking about converting or, oh, yeah, I'm thinking about religion. No, 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 we must make haste. Don't dilly dally. Now is a time to act, especially considering it's New Year's. Make that your New Year's resolution today. Instead of dilly-dallying, instead of being slothful, instead of putting aside and delaying your return to Christ, do it today. Do it right now. Make haste. Okay, verse 17 says, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. They made known, they knew distinctly and with certainty, or it may be translated according to Pajaninus, that they made it known. Theophocat has, they published abroad. Now, this is very important because what happens whenever we make haste to know Christ? Well, have you ever met a convert before? Whenever you meet converts, what do they do? They talk about our Lord nonstop. And that's what the shepherds did. And that's the attitude that we should always have when we encounter the Christ child. When we encounter the risen Lord. When we encounter Christ in our lives, we must make known what we have seen. We must make known abroad 
We must make known distinctly. We must publish everywhere. Are you doing that? Are you evangelizing? Or are you hiding the light under a bushel? <laughs> As for me, I'm going to let it shine. We'll be right back with more Catholic Drive Time right after this. Some Protestants like to charge the Catholic Church with changing the Ten Commandments because it omits the prohibition of making graven images found in Exodus 20. But is this true? No. And here's the reason why. Like Augustine, the Catholic Church sees the prohibition of making graven images as merely an extension of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. In light of the context, it seems that Augustine was right. For immediately after God prohibits the making of graven images, he says in verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. The prohibition is against idolatry, not the making of images in an absolute sense. So the Catholic Church didn't change the Ten Commandments, and it's not guilty of idolatry and having statues in its places of worship. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. There will come a day when each of us will be asked to review the movie of our life and give an account to God. We will sorrowfully relive the bad times and joyfully revisit the good. Thankfully, no matter what you've done, there is hope. Since Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save it. So if you've been away from church for a while, we invite you to come home and find the peace that only comes from God. Visit catholicscomehome.org. Good morning to you, Archduke Edward Habsburg. Good morning, and thank you for having me on your show. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's a great honor, in fact. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, let's start here. The Habsburgs. Many Americans will have absolutely no idea who the Habsburgs are. We kind of have a really bad habit of not knowing anything outside of the United States. And in fact, I had my own experience in uh, Pennsylvania. I was uh, visiting with my friends with the TFP, and His Imperial Royal Highness Prince Bertrand of Brazil was there, and I was talking to his people around, and we were just like, I had no idea Brazil even had a prince, and people were just having discussions about royalty, and we realized we Americans don't know anything about the royal families of uh, Europe and in, even of South America. So let's start there. The Habsburgs. Who are the Habsburgs, and why are they significant? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a, a short crash course, the espresso version. Um, the Habsburgs ruled over large parts of Europe and for a certain time over large parts of the world, even touching the United States, um, from about uh, 1300 to the First World War, to the eve of the First World War. They are um, a, ru a family of rulers that was mostly based around Austria. The capital was usually Vienna. But as I told you, they ruled over large parts of Europe. And they were always Catholic, very strongly Catholic. And I think their most, most characteristic trait is their marriage politics. They had lots of children, and they rather did alliances by marriage than by war or by conquest. So that's, in short, a very nice family. And we are still around. There is about 400 of us um, everywhere in the world, a few in the States, too. And we have a we have a WhatsApp group nowadays. Uh, we don't rule anymore, of course, um, but we our duty to represent the values that our family has always stood for, and that's why I wrote this book. Amen. You know, and most people will will recognize at least um, one uh, Habsburg, which is uh, the. The, the, I guess, was he, is he blessed now? Is he uh, blessed Carl of Austria? I believe he's blessed now. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, yes. wonderful. Oh, he's very blessed. And, and, you know, it's fun because most people in the States will know blessed Carl, who was the last Habsburg emperor, only ruled for one and a half years during the end of the First World War, lost the empire, lost the war, went into exile and died miserably in exile very shortly after. This is not the kind of person that you would remember from a history book, but he is a humble giant of faith. And for most of our family members, he is probably the greatest Habsburg we had um, because he was a fantastic family father, because he lived 
a, a deep devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, to Eucharistic adoration. He had a rosary in his pocket, and uh, he he really lived for Christ. And and you you could tell in through all his gestures. So. You see, it's not about success in the world. In the eyes of the world, this is the ultimate loser. But in the eyes of also many Americans, as I found out last year when I, I gave a talk in Dallas, and you, you had 700 people in that room, and they loved Blessed Emperor Karl. Um, so you don't always have to be successful in the world to, to do the things right as a Catholic. Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, usually the opposite uh, is the case. But one thing that is interesting, oh, one little, little quick comment, my, my little sister actually, she's a professional artist, and she uh, did a beautiful drawing of that image of, of Blessed Carl, and, and I just uh, absolutely, I, so we've recently became had devotion to Blessed Carl, but very interesting. Let's start here. You have your seven rules for turbulent times. This is more geared towards, uh, it seems, just anybody, not just if someone wants to be a king of a country, but in fact, just everyday uh, man and woman. But I loved how you started with rule number one, I that getting married and having lots of kids. I was just talking about this yesterday, in fact, how we should have our investments in our children rather than in our in this world in the riches of this world uh, let's start there why is that a a trait or a rule for a habsburg and why we should follow yes you absolutely saw that correctly the idea of the book is not um, to speak to princes so you don't have to be a prince to follow the seven rules for turbulent times that i propose but there are rules that everybody can live that we should um, we we should want to find these things more in our society today because many of them have gone uh, out of fashion and I don't think it's a good idea and also we should ask them from our politicians that's one of the points of my book so really rules you will read the book you learn a little bit about how the Habsburgs dealt with these topics but in the end you should always ask yourself is this something for me and of course. The first and foremost thing is the thing that I've experienced myself. I have been blessed with a very happy marriage and with six wonderful children, um, thanks to my very generous and courageous wife. And, um, and I've learned that I think family and having lots of children is not only the way to get you and your spouse happy and the children and the children, but also the antidote to all the woke, crazy um, tendencies of our current society, of our technocracy. Um, you know, we live in a time where everything, society, advertising, technical uh, advancement, tries to pull everyone alone and without roots in front, of a, in front of a screen and to glue you to your phones and to the internet and to, to, to social media. Family is the absolute antidote to that. Family is what grounds you in reality. And you know, Hungary, my state, Hungary, I'm ambassador of Hungary, as you said, um, we encourage families to have more children by financial subsidies, but also by speaking publicly about um, how good it is to have family. And this is something a state should do because families with many children are the building bricks of a just, good, merciful society. In, in, a, in a family, in a numerous family, you learn every virtue that you need to build a good society. So therefore, I say, get married and have lots of children. Don't stop at one and a half. Don't even stop at three. Family begins after three. And, uh, and uh, I arrived here in the States. You know, I'm, I'm right now in the States, touring here, uh, reading from my book. I'm in Philadelphia right now. And I, I went to a dinner at the evening I arrived with jet lag. And in this room were sitting three families who had more than eight children. And I thought, God bless America. <laughs> God bless America. We, we, that doesn't exist in Europe. That doesn't exist in Europe. Yeah, that's, it's very interesting. I know whenever I was growing up, I went to a public school when I was younger. And we have a family of, of six, four, four kids and my parents. And everybody wow. was like, oh, my goodness, you have a giant family. And then I started hanging out in more traditional Catholic circles. And everybody has 12, 9, 11 kids. And they were like, wow, <laughs> you only have four kids in your family? And it's just a, a huge night and day difference. Uh, but we're about to go to a break. When we come back, I want to talk about rules 
three, five, and seven. I think they're very, very interesting. The rule number three uh, is about subsidiarity. Uh, rule number five is yes. know who you are and live accordingly. And rule number seven is yes. die well. We're going to head to a quick very break. Important. When we come back, I want to talk more about these three rules. I find it very interesting and it applies directly to the crisis that we fall into in America today. And I think it's apropos that we have these lessons. So check it out. The name of the book is The Habsburg Way. And it's, by the way, it's Habsburg with a B, not with a P. Seven Rules for Turbulent Times, published by Sophia Institute Press. Check it out. We'll be right back. Speaking of celebrating, we have the Archduke Edward Habsburg, the ambassador to uh, or to the Holy See from Hungary. I was going to say the other way around and caught myself. The We're talking about his new book, The Habsburg Way, Seven Rules for Turbulent Times, uh, published by Sophia Institute Press. I highly recommend this book. It's so wonderful. And it really is apropos to the errors of our day. Uh, good morning to you, and thank you for joining us, uh, Mr. Habsburg. Thank you very much for having me on your wonderful show. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're talking about rule number uh, three, five, and seven. In the previous segment, we talked about who the Habsburgs were and rule number one, get married and have lots of kids. And now we're talking about the rules three, five, and seven. If every, when people want to know the other rules, they're going to have to get the book. But let's start here. Subsidiarity. This is something that is not a co- part of the common lexicon, something that is more recently uh, kind of developed in terms of our language. But I find this interesting because subsidiarity is the idea that the things should be done at the lowest level possible. And this is completely contradictory to the American mindset of what a empire is like, what a kingdom is like, what a king is like. So how is this a Habsburg rule? And what, am I, what are Americans not understanding? Well, I'm, I'm happy, Adrian, that you, that, you, that you pointed out that rule, because for me, this is the core of, of the book. And I think the most important rule for our times. What I found out writing this book was how surprisingly close uh, the Habsburg ideas and the Holy Roman Empire ideas are to what America is built upon. Um, What America used to be, perhaps. Perhaps we've lost it a bit from sight. America is built from the grassroots level. It's built on the basis of the family, of the township, of the county, of the state. And the federal level originally was rather weak. And um, and that's the way the Holy Roman Empire, and also later the Austro-Hungarian Empire of the Habsburgs were. This was a loose union of many, many different kingdoms, dukedoms, princedoms under one emperor that was not very strong. He was imbued with sacred authority. He was anointed to be emperor, and he swore on relics. So there was, there was a, a sacredness around him, but he had no real power, not enough money, no real army, no capital, no diplomats. And he just had his authority as highest judge, and he had to very respectfully do this. He couldn't, like, you know, the evil emperor in Star Wars, suppress all the planets in the galaxy, evilly, cackling evilly, and uh, his stormtroopers suppress everyone in terror. But it was a very complicated diplomatic juggling and balancing game. And it was built on subsidiarity. The idea is that you respect the lower levels. In a union of different uh, nations, you respect the language, the customs, the habits, the rights, um, the different personalities of each nation. Um, Emperor Charles V in the 16th century wrote to his son, Philip II, and he said, if you don't respect the single nations within your empire, and all what, what, what qualifies them, you will be in trouble. And the same goes for the United States. You are, some people seem to forget that you are united States. You still are. And um, in, in the crisis of the last three years, we have sometimes seen that states went a different path than the federal level went. And that's the power of the United States. You still have very much power on the local level. Some of it has been taken away in the last 150 years. But this is a great thing because the closer you are to the basis, the closer you are to the local level, the better you know how to do things. And the Habsburgs, whenever they tried to not act according to subsidiarity, to centralize their empire, to introduce, for instance, one language for all the countries in the empire, it always went wrong. And we live in a time where a certain bureaucratic structure is very interested in centralizing power, in drawing everything to higher and higher levels, 
away from the local level. And that, of course, is dangerous because it, it threatens democracy. Democracy is built upon the idea that the people vote for politicians who will then do politics according to their, the idea of their mind, man, majority. But if decisions are being taken very far away from the voters' level, then, then you get into trouble. That's a central point of my book. Yeah, it's, that's wonderful, and so much more could be said there. Visit the sick? Am I supposed to do that? I'm a patient at a state hospital, and uh, we have no Catholic minister. We have no priest, no deacon that comes to see us. And the only blessing I have is a radio to listen to my Catholic family, my Catholic ministry. And I want to say God bless you and thank you very much for your ministry, number one. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have a connection to my family out there. And as to the Holy Father, oh, what a blessing. Yesterday I listened to him. I just remembered that I was part of a Catholic family, that no matter where I am, how far away I am, and no matter how lonely I might get sometimes, I'm part of the universal family. Universal that, Church. Excuse me, but you know what? I love you guys. Every time you support the Guadalupe Radio Network, either by prayer or finances, you go with us to visit the sick, the imprisoned, and those that are homebound. Call 888-784-3476 or visit grnonline.com to make your gift. Listen to The Spirit World with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. Demonic activity appears to be on the rise. I'm Debbie Giorgiani, and I invite you to join Adam Bly and me this weekend for The Spirit World. On The Spirit World, we offer a Catholic perspective on angels, demons, and how the spiritual and physical worlds interact. Saturdays at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern on the Guadalupe Radio Network and other EWTN radio affiliates. Visit grnonline.com slash spiritworld. So everyone can read it. But let's go to rule number seven. This is very, very it's relevant in all times and all places. And recently, my, my great grandmother just passed away. And so we witnessed this exact thing happening uh, to die well. We had my, uh, my, the, her, her old pastor, or actually her old deacon, actually, who's now a priest, came and gave last rites to my grandmother uh, before she died. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. And so t dying well, how is this a Habsburg uh, legacy? Well, <laughs> This is probably my favorite chapter in the book. This is the one that I could have put in the first place because all Habsburgs very consciously lived with their eyes um, towards their death. They knew that the moment of their death would decide about their eternal happiness. So they wanted to prepare for that. They prayed for a good death, and they made sure they were in a state of grace by regularly going to the sacraments, to confession, and to prepare, and then to be ready when death came. They also knew that their death was public. People learned about how they died, and they, they took their cues from them. They decided, if, if the emperor dies this well, I want, to be, I want to be like that too. And so the Habsburgs made sure that they died accompanied by the sacraments, that their people prayed for them, and that their funeral was a sermon. And I will give you an example for that. This is not something that all of us can do, but it gives you an example what the difference between the Habsburgs and, for instance, the English monarchy is. We all watched, many of us watched, um, the funeral of Queen Elizabeth, like many of us will watch the coronation um, this weekend. And um, Queen Elizabeth was a very humble and good woman, I think. And when her coffin was lowered into the crypt at the end of the ceremony with a beautiful trumpet playing, um, they read out her titles. Um, and it was very beautiful and, and, and poignant, but I thought, whoa, the Habsburgs did that better. The Habsburgs did that better. Well, um, that's, uh, we're all out of time, unfortunately. So he says the Habsburgs did it better. So I was, when I was at um, the Pennsylvania, there was, uh, we were out there at night and we were doing a Marian procession with our Lady of Sorrows, um, our Lady of Macrina. And it was a very cloudy night, very, very cloudy, but there was a full moon out. And I was thinking about Our Lady being symbolized by the moon hmm. and how the moon reflects the light of the sun. And that's where it gets its illumination from. And so that's Our Lady uh, reflecting the light of her sun. And then I was thinking that the cloud passed over the moon and covered her. Almost like a veil of tears. Almost like a veil of tears. Hmm. And I was thinking, I was like, 
you know, it made me think of John chapter one. And you think the the darkness covers covers it, right? The darkness the darkness cannot comprehend it. The darkness cannot overcome it. Because even though the light dimmed significantly when the light when it came over, you could still see like a ray of the moonlight around the cloud. And then you also knew objectively the moon is still there. Even though the cloud is there covering it, the moon is still there. I love that. So I was thinking, okay, so in the disaster we see, in the whenever there's a cloud of just depression, of evil, of wickedness all the way around us, everywhere you turn, it's just a cloud. We recognize that there's still that shimmer of hope, that shimmer of Our Lady around it, and that we know objectively by faith that Our Lady is still there and she's still shining her light. And all we have to do is take it in. All we have to do is respond to that grace. It only takes a tiny bit. A little bit of grace goes a long way with Our Lady. That's fantastic. I, I love that that reflection, Adrian. It must have been such a, a profound moment, you know, doing a procession and and being illuminated in that way to to think about that. It reminds me of this conversation we were just having with uh, with uh, Shaista about the the transhuman movement, right? And you think about all of these men and women who are just completely scared. They're they're acting out of fear, and they don't they don't want to approach our Lord. They don't understand this great love that Our Lady has for us. That our Lord has for us, they 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 see and they fear instead, and they want to preserve their life here. And I think about these these stories that we cover sometimes, and it, it just gives me a lot of um, comfort to know that there is there is something more to to the world than just these these bad news stories. Sometimes that there's actually something that we look forward to, something hopeful at the end. Um, and I feel sad for the people who uh, don't know this yet, uh, that they live in this, the, the darkness of the world, and they, they don't know that there's actually a, a God who loves them, who wants to be with them, who created them. Uh, I think I would go crazy if I didn't know uh, that that was the ultimate end of my life and all of the other people around me. The, and back in 1921, Pope Benedict XV instituted today, November 8th, as the feast day of Our Lady of Mediatrix of All Graces. You know, it's something that we should think about more often because people will say, oh, Mediatrix of All Graces, that's, we shouldn't say that because that's, <laughs> it's not a dogma of the church. It's like, yeah, it's not declared but a dogma. But that's against Jesus. Jesus gives us the grace. Yeah, it's like he does through mm -hmm. Our Lady. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, but St. Louis de Mumford, he actually talks about this element in his book on true devotion to Mary. And I cannot recommend enough. If you've never read true devotion to Mary, I cannot recommend it enough. The, the secret of the rosary is really good. And I always recommend that one because it's small, easy to read. True devotion to Mary is a little bit more difficult. It has a little bit more uh, profundity to it, uh, but it's a necessary read. He says, only Mary found grace before God without the help of any other creature. And after her, all those who found grace before God found it only through her. Mary was full of grace when the archangel Gabriel saluted her and was filled with grace when the Holy Ghost so mysteriously overshadowed her. From day to day, from moment to moment, she increased so much this twofold plenitude that she attained an immense an inconceivable degree of grace. So much so that the Almighty made of her the sole custodian of his treasures and sole dispenser of all his graces so that she might ennoble, exalt, and enrich all she chooses. She could lead them along the narrow path to heaven and guide them through the narrow gate to life. She can give a royal throne, scepter, and crown to whomever she wishes. Jesus is always and everywhere the fruit and son of Mary. And Mary is everywhere in the true tree that bears the fruit of life. The true mother who bears that son. So we'll leave that at that quote. One thing 
that you can think of in regards to Our Lady as Mediatrix of All Graces. Think about the Miraculous Medal. If you have a Miraculous Medal, uh, gaze at it this today. Look at it. Look at the rays that come down from the hands of Our Lady. Look at those rays. Whenever St. Catherine Labore received the apparition, she saw those rays coming out of her hands like stones. They were stones and the rays of grace were coming out. And that's what it was. She said, those rays are rays of grace. But she said, then there were some of the stones in her hands that were not sending out grace. They didn't have rays coming out of them. They were dark. And Catherine Labore asked Our Lady about those rays. And Our Lady said, those are rays. Those are graces that I wish to give to the world. I wish to give to individuals, but that people will not receive them, but that people do not ask for them. Our Lady is the mediatrix of all graces. She holds the treasury of graces within her. And she wishes to give them to you. Will you take them? Will you accept them? That is the question. That is a question we have to ask ourselves. And that is a prayer that we should pray every single day. Mary, give me the graces that you wish to give to the world that they will not accept. I will accept them. And that grace may be a suffering. That grace may be a responsibility. It may be a burden. Ask her for that grace anyway. So we'll conclude this meditation on Our Lady Mediatrix of All Graces by praying a memorare together. I ask you to pray with me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. O Mary, concede without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. I just love Our Lady as Mediatrix of all graces. And let's pray that this be declared a dogma of the church and that she be exalted evermore. And today, be proud of Our Lady. Be proud of her. Do not be afraid to talk about her to your loved ones, to your neighbor, to your friends, to your coworkers. Exalt her today. That is your mission. As a good son likes to talk positively about their mother, if you are a good child, then talk about how great your mother is today. And don't forget to call her. Say the rosary today. Pray the rosary every day, but especially today, say an extra couple prayers dedicated to our lady. This is Lavinia Spirito for Catholic Way Bible Study. In Matthew 19, we learn about a servant whose master had just forgiven his debts. Although the servant is grateful for his master's mercy, he is unable to show the same kind of mercy towards his own debtor, even though they owed him an amount that was much smaller. His master moved with compassion for his servant, who never in a thousand years could have repaid his huge debt, forgives all. What life-changing mercy! Yet how much more mercy was shown the day Jesus came to the world to set us free from the bondage of sin and death. Through this parable of the forgiven servant, Jesus makes his point crystal clear. Forgive your enemies, family, and friends, because in the measure that we forgive and show mercy, so forgiveness and mercy will be shown us. Jesus has shown us unfathomable mercy. Who in your life needs a little mercy today? Catholic Way Bible Study. Peace, power, purpose. Find out more at cwbs.org. Catholic Radio was there for me when I needed it. Even though I didn't think I needed it, it was there for me. I want everybody to know that I'm giving, not so that I can sit there and say that I gave to GRN for any other reason but this. I want that radio station to be there for anyone else who needs it also. They may not think they need it, but it's going to be there for them, whether it's in the future, whether it's right now. I want that radio station to always be there for them, just like it was there for me. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. 
there is a post uh, from a Daniel O'Connor. I actually don't know who Daniel O'Connor is, but his uh, he says a Catholic husband, father of five, author, philosophy professor, and engineer. Uh, so there you go. I don't really know who this guy is, but he had this post go viral. Like people were just up in arms, either in uh, hatred against him. It got 148,000 views. This guy is uh, not that popular, but his viral his post went completely viral. And I was like, this is actually a pretty good post. Why doesn't that ever happen to me? I know. That's what I was thinking. I was like, I never get anything like that happen. But he did an excellent post about the sacrament of confession. And I'm like, I don't know why people are mad. He's right. So he put basically out he a let open letter to priest. And I think this is a great PSA. And so I wanted to go through this article and kind of get your take on this, Rudy, because I think you may have experienced something like this before. I think everybody has to be honest. Uh, here it is. Dear priest, you've got to get a hold on this. I just spent almost half an hour today waiting for one woman to get out of the confessional while I was def- oh, desperately trying to keep the two youngest of my five kids quiet in church. Obviously, I could not hear the words. I would have moved further away if I could have heard them. But no one present could avoid hearing the nonstop laughter, the giddy con- conversing and in general, a coffee shop atmosphere emanating from the confessional the whole time. From both the priest and the penitent. I'm sure the penitent instigated this approach, but the priest was obviously going right along with it for half an hour (laughs) with a line of people waiting. And this is a common occurrence. He has that spaced out, so I'm reading it the way he had it spaced out. Oh, my goodness. So before I go on any further with with his letter... What I want to get your take on that. Oh, my goodness. I would have left. I would have left five minutes into that. No way. I would not have stayed. That's crazy. Yeah. I've definitely had that experience. I'm not the only one. Well, not to that extreme, but I've I've sat in confession. Now here's the here's crazy thing, right? Here's the, here's the thing. Look, they have conferences uh, that span years and years, and they talk about the sacrament of penance. And they do, you fly all of the bishops in. Listen, it's not that hard. Let me give you the, the, the formula for success here. You tell your priests not to just hold confession for 30 minutes on a Saturday. Right. The answer is you clear out their schedule because this is paramount to our faith. You know, we acquire so much muck onto our souls that we need the more, more than 30 minutes in a, a week so that we can go and receive this sacrament that actually renews our soul a little bit. So all you have to do is clear out their schedule a little bit, and maybe, this is crazy, I know this is like a novel concept, maybe even have it for an hour at least, and not just on Saturday, but maybe even do this all during the week. Whoa. That's I know crazy, it's a novel concept. That's wild. That way, you have more opportunity to laugh and yuck it up in the confessional. Well, okay, so you the that kind of conversation should be reserved for a private conversation. Mm-hmm. If you plan to have a long conversation with the priest, you should schedule an appointment. And I think a lot of this also is the moving from going behind a curtain to going face to face. It kind of uh, becomes a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Versus when you're kneeling in a confessional and you're covered, your face is covered. It kind of sets the tone Mm -hmm. for like here I'm kneeling. The priest is sitting. I'm accusing myself of the sin and I'm not trying to justify. I'm not trying to discuss it. I'm trying to get it off my soul. I've had people tell me like, hey, how do you do such quick confessions? Like you must have like no sins. I'm like, dude. No. I got a list, <laughs> but that's the thing. I have a list and I yeah. go through it and I go one, two, three, four, five and list all the things. The priest will just be like, okay. And if, if he feels a need, he will point out a particular sin that I am struggling with and he'll give me advice on it. And then he will say, okay, make dramatic attrition. And that'll be it. It'd be very quick. I get my in and out in under two minutes, almost all the time. Um, it doesn't. You don't need to take thirty minutes. There's no excuse. Here's the thing, too. It, 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 there's been this like conflation between confession and counsel, right? Right. And I I struggle with this sometimes because, you know, there's moments where I do want to have the counsel, but I know that it it adds uh, like a lot of time for the rest of the people in line. You don't have to give counsel. Yeah. Every single time. 
I mean, if you find something egregious, obviously, and your heart is telling you our Lord is, is uh, you know, maybe prodding your heart as a priest to give a little bit of counsel, okay, sure, give counsel. But you don't, you're not obligated to give a counsel to every single person in line. I mean, just think of it. If there's 20 people in line, how long is it going to take? Mm-hmm. That's quite, that's, that's it's, a, I mean, there's catch a, 22. a list, there's a line of people outside trying to get confession. Now, he goes on in his open letter. He says uh, to priest, this is basically sacrilege. It's not just a great disservice and a complete lack of basic manners, though it certainly is that. It's an offense against the very holiness of the sacrament itself, and it's driving people away from God's grace. I wonder how many people are now going about their lives in Satan's grip, still in a state of mortal sin, because they tried to go to confession, but turned around when they saw the mockery that is being made of it, if it is even offered at all, in so many Catholic churches today. In my writings and talks for 15 years now, I've been incessantly begging people to go to confession. Why should I keep doing this if even the priests themselves treat it like a joke or only offer it for 30 minutes of a confession once a week or make no attempt to regulate it appropriately in their own parishes? I ask this rhetorically, of course. In fact, no matter what, I will never stop advocating strongly for confession. And then he has a couple bullet points that are, I think are excellent. He says, confession is not the time for chit chat or jokes. It's not a therapy session. It is not a time to vent. It's not a time to complain about others, which honestly, that would, you'd be committing a sin in the confessional for gossiping about others. It is not an opportunity for lonely people to find a conversation with a captive audience. Publicly advertised confession times are not the time for lengthy spiritual direction. Publicly advertised confession times are not the time for general confessions. That is for practicing Catholics who are already in God's grace, of course. If a soul who has been away from the sacraments for years, living a life of grave sin, and now coming back to the faith, enters the confessional, he or she should always be accommodated regardless of circumstances. And this is the thing. I don't know why people are upset. He's very, very reasonable here. He's not being like, there should never be long confessions. He's saying, in general, you should be in and out, especially if you're a regular practicing Catholic. If you're a Catholic who goes to church every Sunday, your confession should be under five minutes. I would say under two minutes, but I'll be generous to say under five minutes. It should be under five minutes. But obviously, if someone is coming back to the faith for the first time, then yes, you you would might go into the confessional. Maybe you didn't even do an examination of conscience because you didn't know. You didn't know I was supposed to do one. So the priest may walk you through how to do an examination and then may have to go through and it may take a while. It may take a while. That may happen. But many places, I mean, this is happening all the time, and I really doubt that they're getting a someone coming back to the confession every single time. So he goes on and says, it is imperative upon all priests to ensure that confession does not become any of those things listed above or anything like them. When you see that a penitent is turning confession into a chit chat or a gossip time, joke time, therapy time, confess other people's sins time, please intervene and remind them they should simply say what their sins are. Another good idea is having confession etiquette sheets placed prominently near the confession line. Another important thing is to structure a confession line well. For example, clearly defined starting point of the line, noted with a big sign, the area within earshot of the confessional roped off. Otherwise, the line for confession just becomes another occasion of sin. I think this is very good, very good I think to advise people to do. And priest, I mean, it's very simple. Just tell them, I don't... Uh, Thank you for being here. I don't need, we don't need to um, go through all the details. I just need to know what happened and how many times. Uh, because I, I understand. I mean, a lot of people were not catechized on how to do confession, so they feel the need to explain the entire situation. But I don't need to know um, what specifically you said. I just need to know that you gossiped. I don't know. We need to know who you gossiped about. I just need to know you gossiped. Now he goes on. He says, we call you, dear priest, father. We do this because that is precisely what you are, fathers, not uncles. Perhaps an uncle can always be buddy-buddy and never have to give any correction of any sort. It can always just go with the flow. Well, if that's how you're going about your priestly ministry, you need a major change. Be a father, not an uncle, not a buddy, a father. Huge streams of people are about to come back to confession. You, dear priest, must prepare for that. Hold more confession times preferably even even before daily Mass, and manage them well. Get ready. Now is the time to renew your approach. 
and your parish's approach to this great sacrament. That's the end of his letter. And people were very upset about this, and I don't really understand quite why, because it's very true. It's a very true thing. Well, perhaps now is a time to change. Perhaps now is a time to recognize, maybe I'm not doing it quite right. And you can change. You can adjust it. And this is my method of going to confession. I'll share with you my method, and you can uh, copy it if you'd like. There's not a one way to do it, but there is uh, formulas, and this is a formula that I follow. I go into the confessional. I make a genuflection, make the sign of the cross before entering the confessional. I kneel down, and I say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been one week since my last confession. I accuse myself of the following sins. I then list out my sins in number and in kind, uh, what I did and how many times I did it. I then say, for these and for all my sins, I ask pardon from God and penance from you, Father. The priest will then either give me advice, will chat with me a little bit if he deems that necessary, and the priest will say, uh, make an act of contrition. I will say, say my act of contrition. My God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended thee. I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. But most of all, because it offended thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love, I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to sin no more and avoid the near occasion of sin. Amen. And the priest will then let me out, say, have a blessed day, have a blessed week, whatever it is he says. And I say, thank you, Father. And I'm out. Very simple, very easy. That's the way I do it. And feel free to copy the method I learned. That's the method I learned, and you're welcome to take it. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. Guadalupe Radio Network announces the launch of La Promesa Legacy Circle, formed to recognize and honor our dedicated donors who have made long-term commitments to the network through gifts from their estates. We invite you to join our family and allow us to be a part of your personal legacy. For more information on making a legacy gift for the benefit of the GRN and a guide to charitable estate planning, contact our friends at the Catholic Foundation at 972-661-9792 or info at catholicfoundation.com. I have a friend who says that baptism is a symbolic act and that it has nothing to do with salvation. How can I answer him? Simple. Show him what the Bible says. Nowhere does the Bible say that baptism is merely a symbolic act. That passage simply does not exist. But the Bible does say this about baptism. In Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27, it says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will put my spirit within you. Here in the Old Testament, we have a foreshadowing of New Testament baptism. In the New Testament, Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No symbolic language here. The book of Acts says, Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Ezekiel says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from your uncleannesses. The book of Acts says, And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel says, And I will put my spirit within you. Do you begin to see how God in the Old Covenant was preparing us for what He gives us in the New Covenant? Acts 22, 16, And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. What body was that? The body of Christ. 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. Scripture simply does not support the non-Catholic notion that baptism is symbolic. Scripture does, however, very clearly and directly support the Catholic teaching that baptism saves us, that baptism makes us members of the body of Christ, that baptism washes away sin, and that through baptism we receive the Holy Spirit just as the church teaches. A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network, radio for your soul.
The Guadalupe Radio Network would like to invite you to listen to A Life Lived Joyfully, a show where we explore the call to holiness and a life of virtue. Join our hosts, Martha Fernandez Sardina, Monsignor Charles Pope, Steve Gleason, and Sarah Soto, as they discuss ways to live an authentic Catholic life, to strive for holiness and grow in virtue. Tune in Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. You can also be a part of the conversation with questions or comments at 877-757-9424. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Praise be to God. It's so good to be on with you today. It's so good to be with you on this last show before Christmas. <laughs> you thought I was going to say last show. Uh, foreshadowing? Maybe? No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Last show before Christmas because this Sunday is Christmas Eve. Can you believe it? We've made it all the way through Advent. It just flew by. And we're already at Christmas Day. I know I've been doing shopping, Christmas shopping, all week long. And it's the worst time for me, personally, because we have Christmas shopping. Then my mom's birthday is on the 19th. And my little brother's birthday is on Christmas Eve. And my brother had decided that he wanted to graduate on the 15th. And so I'm like trying to buy him graduation gifts, my mom birthday gifts, my brother uh, birthday gifts on top of Christmas. It's just been whew, one of those one of those Decembers. Uh, but no matter what happens, no matter how busy things get, we must always be ready to know that we can have confidence and calm and courage with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Calm, courage, and confidence is what I always say, and the person who most imitates that, the person who gives us those virtues, would be the most blessed Virgin Mary. And joining us to talk about the Blessed Virgin, especially in the Immaculate Conception, is Father Thaddeus. Father Thaddeus is the author of his book, Shining and Spotless Splendor, Consecration to the Immaculate Conception. Good morning to you, Father Thaddeus. Good morning to you as well. Oh, praise be to God. It's good to have you on. Now, before we jump into interview, I was delighted to find out that you are not only a fellow Texan, but you're also a fellow Houstonian. Of course I am. I'm happy to be Texan and proud to have the flag even in my room to remind my brothers where I'm from. <laughs> Since I'm in Ohio now. <laughs> That's hilarious because uh, I was a, a novice for the Dominican order. Um, and one of the things that the other brothers really did not like, I joined, I uh, was with the Eastern province and so I was in Ohio and I was the only guy from, from Texas and, and I would, everybody knew that I was the brother from Texas because, uh, and everybody was very, they're like, oh, you Texans, every time we get a Texan in here, all they do is talk about Texas. Uh, so we, we, we love to see it. So praise be to God. Amen. 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 Yeah, I, I, I've given my novices and seminarians a few theological arguments to prove why Texas is uh, the best state, but I'll spare the <laughs> listeners that right now, maybe for a different day. <laughs> Praise be to God. Next time you come into Houston to visit home, we'll have to have you on. Maybe that's what the topic will be when you come in. Now, Father Thaddeus, sure. tell me about this book, Shining and Spotless Splendor. Immediately, whenever I got this book, I called um, Dr. Joe on here and was like, hey, this is interesting, but aren't there like a hundred consecration to our lady books. Like why, what's the deal with this one? Why is it different? Why do we get a new one? And he said, you're going to have to ask father Thaddeus that. So he got me, he got me. I got you on so I can ask you this question. So tell me father Thaddeus, uh, why is this book different from the other ones? So I'll first give a response based on my own experience. Uh, I'm a Marian of the Immaculate Conception, which means that our devotion as Marians to our lady is specifically through the prism of this dogma. And it's true that I think a lot of Catholics, we kind of think about it as a privilege of Our Lady and kind of a done deal, like, great, you know, Our Lady was conceived immaculate, and how wonderful for her, and we go to Mass on December 8th, and end of story. And I found myself wondering, okay, here I am, a Marian priest, and I have a great devotion to Mary, but what does it mean that I'm a Marian of the Immaculate Conception? And what impact does that make on my daily life? I mean, I get to wear a white habit now in honor of her immaculate purity, but what does it mean in terms of my spiritual life and my mission, my apostolate? And I imagine that's probably not my own experience. 
And as I began to think about this mystery, I began to read a lot of theology, and I realized there's a lot more to unpack. In fact, St. Maximilian Colby said that the first part of the history of this dogma uh, is bringing it to its proclamation in 1854. And then he says, but that's just the very first page. There's all sorts of other pages yet to be written in unpacking this. And he said in his own time uh, that he thought that this dogma really hadn't been unpacked almost at all and had made almost no impact. And so one of the first things I would say that makes this consecration different is that it isn't just about being consecrated to Mary. It's about being consecrated to the Immaculate Conception. And with that, I do a kind of a play on words that readers find as they advance through the days where St. Maximilian Kolbe refers to Our Lady as the Immaculate Conception, because that's the name she gave herself at Lourdes. But also, he refers to the Holy Spirit as the Immaculate Conception, the Eternal Immaculate Conception. And I hit upon that kind of double use of the name so that it's a consecration not only to Mary, but also to the Holy Spirit. But I kind of reveal that only as you go through the days, because most people think of Mary, the Immaculate Conception. But as I advance through the days, I make people realize this is also about being consecrated not to Jesus through Mary, like St. Louis de Montfort says, but being consecrated to the Holy Spirit through Mary, uh, through as St. Maximilian Colby hints at. And with that, I draw upon the Marians. Um, we have our founder, St. Stanislaus Papchinsky, who made a vow of blood to defend this dogma even before it was proclaimed. And our spirituality is built off of St. Stanislaus Pepchinsky. And so I try to unpack this mystery also as a Marian, because we often hear about Louis de Montfort, St. John Paul II, and other great saints who have wonderful things about Our Lady. But since I'm a Marian of the Immaculate Conception, I, I ask myself, what does my own founder say? And what can he say to us uh, today about Our Lady as the Immaculate Conception? So I was talking to Father Elias Mary of the Franciscans, the Immaculate, not too long ago, and he told me something that blew my mind. He said that the theology of the consecration to Our Lady that St. Maximilian Kolbe came up with, that he developed it completely independently of St. Louis de Montfort, that he was not exposed to St. Louis de Montfort until after he had created the Militia Immaculata. And that just exploded my brain because of how almost identical it was in theology. Uh, tell me about St. Stanislaus, because I don't know anything about him. And I'm, I'm starting to think, OK, I'm about to, my mind's about to be exploded by uh, this other priest, Father St. Stanislaus. So tell me about this priest. So he was born in 1631 in Poland. And originally, he entered the Peerist, which still is a congregation that exists today that helps those who are poor in terms of education and schooling. But because of various issues in the community, he was very fervent in regard to poverty and was quite persecuted. He was put into a prison for several months in the depths of winter in Slovakia and denied the sacraments. And through discernment, he understood that the Lord was calling him to start the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And so in 1670, he made what's called the Oblatio, his self-offering, where he renewed his offering of himself and the life of poverty, chastity, and obedience to God through the hands of the Immaculate Mother. And the very last paragraph of his self-offering is making another vow that he will defend the Immaculate Conception even at the cost of his life. And he created the Marians as the first order, male religious order, to promote this dogma. And in fact, um, the Dominicans, there, there's kind of this theory among Marians, we don't know for sure, but since the Dominicans at the time were hesitant, let's say, about this dogma, uh, it seems that they intervened when St. Stanislaus tried to get papal approval, uh, ironically, from the Pope whose confessor he was. He was actually the confessor for oh, the wow. Pope when he was cardinal in Poland. So it's ironic because this very Pope, who knew St. Stanislaus per, uh, personally, actually didn't approve our rule. He approved our institute. Uh, but it's understood that perhaps some of the Dominicans were unpleased at this idea of promoting the Immaculate Conception so openly through a community. Uh, but that is the primary purpose of this community, the Congregation of Marian Fathers, was to promote the Immaculate Conception, to promote devotion to Our Lady. And St. Stanislaus, unlike St. Maximilian or St. Louis de Montfort or St. John Paul II, doesn't develop a huge theology because he was oriented more towards, let's say, the peasants that he took care of outside of Warsaw and Poland at the time. 
so his examples are often very practical, nothing terribly new where you read it and you go, wow, like I never knew that. Uh, but he drives home very fundamental points uh, about her immaculate conception and about Our Lady, especially in terms of our spiritual lives and how we live it, uh, especially for us as Marians, how we live it together. Wow. Wow. That's beautiful. And I know it always breaks my heart to talk about these things because I am a, a huge devotee to the Dominicans. And whenever the topic comes up, people are like, oh, the Dominicans. And I, <laughs> I'm also a great lover of Venerable Mary of Agreda, who, of course, is a one of the patronesses of Texas. And so tell me about let's talk about her for just a moment. Venerable of Agreda or Agreda, however people like to say it. She, one of the reasons why she's not a saint is because of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, tell me about this. Oh, well, I have to be honest. That's a little beyond my pay grade because okay. I'm not an expert in regard to her. Uh, I've studied her several times, but nothing in depth. So I don't want to enter into the fray with that just yet. <laughs> That's no problem. That's no problem. I, I just find her very fascinating because I had the privilege of uh, going to visit Agrida with my family. And when we were there, we were talking to the different sisters there and they were telling us, yeah, like she was uh, on the track to be canonized. And they were saying, she really pushes that immaculate conception stuff a little too hard. And I mean, it's very interesting because we see this happening in Spain, but then we also see what happening in France at the same time, or well, not the same exact time, but in the same uh, general time period of Our Lady of Lords appearing there and saying, I am the Immaculate Conception, which uh, Max Kolbe picks up as saying, this is something that is not simply, I am immaculately conceived. And you brought this up before. Uh, pick that thread up for me. Yeah, so she's not only referring to kind of the state of her being, but she's referring to her very identity. And that's the nexus or the the point where the two come together, the Holy Spirit and Mary, that St. Maximilian Kolbe draws this analogy that just as a woman takes on the name of her husband upon marriage, so Our Lady, as the spouse of the Holy Spirit, adopts his name. And so he goes to the point of saying, if the Holy Spirit is the uncreated immaculate conception, the fruit of the eternal love of the Father and the Son, then Mary as the icon that reveals the person of the Holy Spirit, she also is the Immaculate Conception in her very being, that it's not just some kind of quality or something that God did and then, you know, is an event in the past, but it's something that marks who she is. And that gets to some John, St. John Paul II actually says in one of his audiences about Mary, he says that when our St. Gabriel uh, announces the birth of the Savior, or the Incarnation, he says the Greek word kekaratomene, he says that is, as it were, a name for Mary. You know, notice that the archangel never says uh, just Mary alone. It's hail full of grace. That is her name. He, he doesn't even say her name Mary. And so St. John Paul II picks up that you who are fully transformed by grace, you who are full of grace, this is who she is in her very essence. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Praise be to God. That's such a, a beautiful theology to try to pick up. And I'm going to I'm going to drop this in here. We're going to go to a quick break. And when we come back, I want to discuss this because something that I read from Max Colby blew my mind. And uh, it's just such a beautiful idea. And it's a little confusing and almost almost scandalous to some people. But I as a Marian Max list myself, I think it's beautiful. <laughs> and he talks about being transubstantiated into her which immediately people their jaw drops like you can't use that word you can't say that of our lady and so i want to read a little passage and we'll talk about the other side of the break he says that we want to belong to such an extent to the immaculate that not only nothing else remains in us that isn't hers but that we become as it were annihilated in her changed into her transubstantiated into her that she alone remains, so that we may be as much hers as she is God's. And that right there is just mind-blowing and just such a beautiful articulation of love of the Blessed Virgin. We're going to go to a quick break. When we come back, I want to pick up on that term, transubstantiation into the Immaculate, a very, very beautiful thing, a very uniquely 
Jacobian thing, a very uniquely Maximilian thing. And I always have that play on words. I love it in in, in English. As, uh, maybe it doesn't work in Polish, but uh, Mary and maximalism and uh, Mary to the max. And you think about Maximilian Kolbe. And so I just I like that uh, little little thing. Someone should write a book and be like Mary to the max and like the theology of Maximilian Kolbe. I think that would be a, a fun a fun book to put together. But when we come back, we'll talk about this and much more. And if you want to connect with us, make sure you go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT. grnonline.com forward slash CDT so you never miss out on anything. You can sign up for our email list there and we'll send you all sorts of great information with us. But we're going to be right back with Father Thaddeus on shining and spotless splendor, consecration to the Immaculate Conception. We'll be right back right after this. This is Dale Offlist with a Chesterton Minute. How many times have you heard someone talk about how important it is to be progressive? Have you ever asked them what they mean by that? G.K. Chesterton says, Progress is a useless word, for progress takes for granted an already defined direction, and it's exactly about the direction that we disagree. We can't have progress until we've stated what our goal is, and then we can determine whether or not we're moving closer to it or farther from it. The real question is not whether we are progressive, but what is our goal? My goal is to get to heaven and to help others get there too. What's yours? Want Chesterton for more than a minute? Visit our website at Chesterton. Hi, this is Dave Palmer. Do you love all that you're learning about the Catholic Church here on the GRN, and are you ready to dive into the deep? If so, join us each Friday afternoon beginning at 1 p.m. Central for Back to the Father on the GRN's Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter pages as we discuss key teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologia and their application to our everyday journey through this life and our goal of returning Back to the Father. Each Friday at 1 p.m. Central, email backtothefather at grnonline.com for more information. And welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Praise be to God. It's so good to be on with you today. Can you believe it? Finishing out Advent. Advent is just about over. Just, let's see, one, two more days. Two more days of Advent, and we're done. We've made it to Christmas. And... What are your plans for Christmas? I'd be very curious. Let me know. Uh, shoot me an email. You can find all of our information, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. Uh, or maybe you can hop onto our social media feeds. Just look up Catholic Drive Time in your favorite social media platform and leave a comment down below. I'd love to know what your plans for Christmas are and what your Christmas traditions are. That would be a great thing to know. Uh, Praise be to God. But joining us right now is Father Thaddeus. He's the author of a book, Shining and Spotless Splendor, Consecration to the Immaculate Conception. And before we went to break, I brought up a very controversial, I'm going to put Father right on the spot, um, a very (laughs) controversial statement from St. Maximilian Kolbe about the Immaculate, the, the Immaculata. And he says that we should be transubstantiated into her. Um, Father Thaddeus, what is St. Maximilian Kolbe talking about? Why does he use the term transubstantiated, a word that we use for the Eucharist? Yes. So uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe has taken a fair amount of flack in regard to this idea for this reason, but uh, it's a helpful analogy. You know, transubstantiation is at the very core of Catholicism that we don't believe that Jesus is just present in the bread and wine, but that it is fully transformed into him. And the idea is similar to what St. Louis de Montfort actually says in regard to being in the Mary mold, that the Holy Spirit basically wants to mold us by grace to be similar to Mary. And this image is where it's a metaphorical use of the idea of transubstantiation. It's not a literal sense in the exact same way as at the Eucharist. But the idea is that in order for us to grow in sanctity, then we need to grow to be more and more like Mary. And so St. Maximilian is getting at this idea that it's not just that we should be a mixture between like, oh, I'm Thaddeus and have the qualities of Our Lady, but rather that I should be all like Our Lady. There shouldn't just be a mixture of like sin and grace in my life. That's what the Immaculata is. It is pure grace, all grace and all holiness. 
And this gets to something close to the Marian tradition of my community when I say Marian, that we pray the chaplet of the 10 virtues of the Immaculata, meaning we want to imitate Mary in her virtues by it showing up in our daily life so that when people see us, they also see the kind of life, the kind of qualities, the kind of actions that Our Lady would have as well in her daily life. And so St. Maximilian Kolbe is getting at the Holy Spirit wants a total transformation to holiness. And the holier you are, the more you resemble Mary, the more you are totally Mary's, much like Jesus himself was, all Mary's. Everything biologically in him is from Mary, period. No, you know, there's no human father in that sense. And I'll take it one step further in terms of the book is that I also connect the whole consecration to the oblation of St. Stanislaus and our former general, Father Pacua, pointed out the very word oblatio in Latin comes from the Roman canon, the first, first Eucharistic prayer. The priest asks that God look favorably upon this oblation, this offering, the bread and the wine before it's consecrated. And the point being, we are to be an oblation with Jesus. The whole point of this consecration is that Jesus is the Immaculate Lamb, and Mary is the Immaculata. Why? So at Calvary, they can become a pure sacrifice pleasing to God. Because in the Old Testament, immaculacy was in reference to goats and lambs and bulls, because they had to be unblemished to become a sacrifice to God. And so for me, the idea of transubstantiation is perfect, because the whole idea of this consecration at the end is so that you can put yourself on that pattern with Jesus and be united to him in his sacrifice like the Immaculata was, so that by offering your sorrows, your sufferings, you can participate in the salvation of the world, that you become an oblation with Mary and union with Jesus. Wow. Wow. That, you just, yeah, wow. That was beautiful. I didn't, I didn't know that about the term Immaculata, the term Immaculate, referring to the animals being ready for sacrifice. That, that is, that's huge. That is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it, it's all through the Old Testament. So when I, I first looked into this, I was looking at a very theological level for myself, my seminarians, who I am helping as a formator. And then I realized, like, wow, this is all over the Bible. But understandably, our, our separated brothers, you know, Protestants, don't like this word because it sounds very papist to use the word immaculate. So you don't find it in the Bible. But you find Paul saying time and again, God from all eternity wants you to be unblemished. Mm -hmm. He's saying immaculate and that's where one of the fundamental theses of these or ideas in the consecration is god wants everybody to be immaculate this isn't just about oh it's really nice that mary is immaculate no the mystery of this immaculate conception for us as marians means this mystery is alive it's not something we just stare at it's something that god wants to work in the church and in each one of us and that's what colby's getting at the Holy Spirit wants to transform us like he transformed the Immaculata. We too are called to be immaculate, which is why we often at times are going to go to purgatory because no sin enters heaven. The Bible makes that clear. So everybody in heaven has to be without sin. So whether now in this life or in purgatory, we all have to be purified of all sin and all have to be transformed by grace like Our Lady. Now, that, that just kind of, they usually struck me there, Father. And I was thinking about when you were talking about this, whenever I was a novice for the Dominican order, we, of course, would wear white. And you yourself wearing white. And that is the perfect penance for living a life is wearing white all the time because we'd get stains on our shirts or what you might call a macula, a spot. Yeah. And yeah. you recognize, okay, I need to make my white habit Immacula without spot, and you sit there and you start scrubbing for hours trying to get those those stains out, especially with the black belt. The ink on the black belt gets on the habit, and it's over. Um, but no, this is exactly what I'm thinking because when we are trying to get rid of that, we're trying to get rid of those spots on our souls, those maculas. But Our Lady is immacula; she is without spot. That is, you just exploded my brain, Father. Thank you very much. Uh, but I want to move over over here because you mentioned something in passing that I've never heard before either, which was the Chaplet of the Ten Evangelical Virtues. I found it in the back of your book here on page two twenty three. Uh, tell me, what is this Chaplet of the Ten Evangelical Virtues? So originally it comes from St. Joan of France, who in 1504 started a community called the Order of the Annunciates. They're not numerous throughout the world, but they still do exist in France and in other countries, I think even Costa Rica. And she apparently was inspired directly by Our Lady to write this rule of the Ten Evangelical Virtues. And she from that then formulated uh, this chaplet 
and you pray basically like a decade of the rosary, but you say at the in the second half, Holy Mary, Mother of God, most prudent, most humble, most faithful on each Hail Mary. And our venerable Father Kazimierz Wyszynski, who died in 1755, capitalized this following, I don't know if he knew the writings of St. Louis de Montfort, but capitalizing this idea that true devotion to Mary involves imitation of her virtues, that yes, we need to pray, yes, we need to do pilgrimages, but it's all in vain. At the end of our lives, we don't actually resemble her. And so I mentioned in passing that St. Stanislaus couldn't have his own rule approved by the Pope at the time. And so he was forced to accept a different rule. And because of his emphasis on the Immaculate Virgin Mary, he chose this rule of the 10 virtues as the rule for the Marians. And it's been, it was our rule until 1909 when we were renovated, but we still keep it as part and parcel of our patrimony, as our tradition. And so I myself pray it daily. And it's a, a good examination of conscience as a way of comparing, uh, to use Colby's words, how transubstantiated am I? You know, how much do I I truly live totally like Our Lady in my life by imitating her virtues? Wow, wow, that's amazing. Now, okay, the one going back to the actual book itself real quickly in the few minutes we have left here is it's a little strange. Instead of 33 days, which a lot of uh, the books are, yours is like 38 slash 40. Um, tell me about the schedule here of how if someone wanted to do it, let's get down to the practicality of it. Yes, I was almost reprimanded by one of my brothers who saw that it was 39. He says, 39, that makes no sense. You got to make it 40. At least it's biblical. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have the 40th day is like the, the day after. The reason for the strange number is that I originally uh, had it hinged on a liturgical time because I like connecting our devotions to the liturgy. And, and the Vatican emphasizes that in the Second Vatican Council. Our devotions shouldn't just be random. They should help us live the liturgy and the Eucharist better. And the whole point of this consecration is to live the Eucharist in a more powerful way, which is also fitting for this year of the Eucharist. I didn't have that planned, but the Lord apparently did. Um, and so I start with October 31st with the Eve of All Saints, Halloween, because the idea is that we're all called to be saints and we're all called to be saints like the Immaculata, December 8th. And so the number of days between those two is why we wind up with this number of days mm. in the consecration. You can do it whenever you want, but that's the original idea. That's kind of the original time frame for this consecration. Understood, understood. And um, I got kind of off topic, but I saw this in the back of the book and I wanted to ask about this, is the confraternity, the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, what is this? Right, so we from almost the very beginning of our congregation have had this confraternity as a way of associating lay people with our spirituality. So sometimes you'll hear, for instance, Dominicans, you know, third order Dominicans, third order Carmelites, third order Franciscans. We don't have what's called a third order, but canonically, we had a little discussion about this uh, amongst us Marians. The confraternity is our third order. So people who want to be associated with the Marians while living their lay life, live our spirituality, understand our saints and our, our life, that is how you do it. It is by joining the confraternity of the Immaculate Conception that helps you receive formation. For instance, about the 10 virtues, there's uh, a whole plethora of writings already written on that. And my next book is actually going to be about the 10 virtues. Uh, so it kind of gives you access to living our spirituality and being part, as it were, as a layperson of our congregations. Wow. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. All right, Father, we're just about out of time. Uh, tell me, where can people get the book? Where can people learn more about the Immaculata? So you can find it on shopmercy.org, which is the Marian's website for all of our products. I think in January it will officially be on Amazon and all the other normal outlets as well. Um, but I would encourage you, if you want to go directly to our website, shopmercy.org. I'd invite you to find it there. There you go, shopmercy.org. Thank you very much, Father Thaddeus. God bless you. God love you. Oh, and really quickly, can you leave us with your blessing? Absolutely. May Almighty God fill you with this grace, peace, and mercy now and always. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Thaddeus. God bless you. God love you. And have a very Merry Christmas. Thank you. To you all as well. And that's going to do it. For the radio side, we are going to Christmas. We're going to Christmas weekend. Can you believe it? We made it. So I'll see y'all back on Monday with the pre-recorded show. Tuesday, we'll be back live in studio. Rudy and I will be there. But God bless you. God love you. And I look forward to hearing how your Christmas went. We'll see y'all very soon. Very Merry Christmas. Thank 
you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you.